So today we are dealing with two huge subjects, which we could spend uh, six months on at least on each of them. So please understand that we are just going to talk about some key principles here. All right. I want above all else to encourage you about these two areas, whether you are directly involved now or not, I want you to learn and be encouraged. Now, we are sending notes to you about what I've said and a couple of additional things as well. So as I'm going through this material, I don't want you to feel that you have to absorb or understand or process everything I'm saying. You will be able to read and reflect on that later. I will just pick up what I think in my in a short time we can discuss together. Now, discipleship. Do you remember the Lord's last command? The very last words he spoke, he spoke it to believers. And, you know, if you knew that you had one, say, half an hour on Earth, planet Earth, before you were leaving, you would be thinking very carefully about who you wanted to talk to and what you would say. Now, Jesus knew he was going to heaven. And the last thing he said was, you people will be my witnesses and you need to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. Then you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the end of the earth and you will go out doing that. You'll go out being my witnesses. So that's important. And the issue for us is those early disciples took very seriously what Jesus said. Now, I three weeks ago, we looked at a picture. Uh, well, we looked at a picture about how the church responded to the Great Commission. But I want to look at this verse that you all know really well. Who, I mean, we are all quite familiar with this verse, which is also the last words of Jesus that are given to us in Matthew. And it says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And that means... Sorry, yes. Trevor. Trevor, yes. sorry to interrupt. So um, the, the situation here, I need to let you know, the, the screen is now, you're not able to see in full. So, uh -huh. yeah, so that's... Uh, what are you seeing? You're just seeing a, a part there of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let, let's get out of that then. Yeah, then um, reopen it. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's good, yeah. Is yeah. that better? Okay. Yeah. So, no, no. Can you just uh, add to full screen? Yep, that, that one. That's what I want to do. Yeah. But that's... Yeah, yeah, that that's, a, yeah. Okay, it's now? okay now. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Very Excellent. good. I thought I'd done it that way. It's it, it was showing the same for me, but it wasn't for you. So here... We see Jesus is saying, we've got to go to every ethnic group. But the key verse here in this passage in the Greek is make disciples. That is the core verb. Everything else is built around that verb. The command of Jesus is, in a sense, saying, he doesn't say go. He says, as you are going, he, it means he expects every disciple of his to be going to people who need to hear about him. As you are going, make disciples. And making disciples is the key verb here. Baptizing them and teaching them, they are part of making disciples. So Jesus' main command to us is about being a witness and making disciples. Now, do you remember this map from uh, about three weeks ago? Perhaps you don't. There were many things. 
in that map. But I want you to look at it in terms of these last words of Jesus. Now, you can see the first, when Jesus was on earth uh, and he went to glory, there were just a few believers. And on the day of Pentecost, the first 3,000 believers. But now look what happened uh, in that first section up into, say, about the third and fourth century. Do you realize there that about 20% of the world's population became Christian in the first 400 years of the church? They were very serious about making disciples. But then sadly, notice, for the next thousand or even 1400 years right up to here right up to there there's no real growth in the church at all and the reason for that one of the main reasons was people were not making disciples then you see the growth again here we see the church beginning to grow as christians went out testifying to Jesus and making disciples. So brothers and sisters, I want to say to you, making disciples is really, really important. It needs to be a priority in our church ministry and in our life ministry. Now, I'm going to ask Jeff to put you in small groups to think about these two questions for about five minutes. Share in your small group, just briefly, what priority discipleship has. Is it important or not? Just be honest about what you think the priority of actually discipling people is. And then share something of your own personal experience in discipling. Maybe you have been discipled and you can talk about that, or you may have discipled other people or seen the benefit of discipling by other people just share very briefly those things in your small groups thanks jeff he will break you into groups now I hope the questions are clear enough for you. Hey, Joy, Sugyang, can you just join your group? Oh, I, <laughs> I, uh, I pressed the wrong button, so I can't. Oh, really? I can be here. Uh, okay, in that case. Hmm. Oh. I think the discussion will be almost over. <laughs> I see the time is just one minute. Okay. Oh, so what, what happened? You already returned back. No, we don't we don't know what happened. Okay, well look, let's just keep going. It's all right. Let's just screen share again. Oh uh, okay, sorry. Don't worry about it. We'll be okay. Come on, let's get our 
So, Trevor, would you want to go, go straight or do you want to so still? We'll, we'll go on. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for that. That's okay. I, I do want you to think about, um, I do want you to think about uh, this. Um, um, come on, out of there. This question, though, that I asked you. Uh, come on. What are you getting there? Can you say? Yeah. Click the full screen for us. Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. uh, got it this time. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So I want you to think that. Just think for a moment. We didn't seem to get into our small groups. That's okay. Is discipling something that happens intentionally in your church context? That's something just to think about. And what is your own experience? I have been blessed to be discipled. In a way, indirectly, my father discipled me. He was a very godly man. And he didn't kind of sit with me every day or constantly uh, encouraging me and talking to me about discipling the way we often think about it but he set a great example i would know 6 15 in the morning he would be kneeling by his bed praying and reading his bible and he lived a life that was godly now my dad unfortunately i think i said was killed when I was 13 years of age in a, a car accident. But then my pastor discipled me when I was about 15 for a year or so and met with me every Saturday morning and helped me to learn to study the Word of God, to memorize scripture and be involved in ministry. That was so important. So my life, has been about discipling people ever since. So discipling is something I started to do. And my first disciple was a Hong Kong Chinese man who had just come to Australia from a Buddhist background. So my first disciple was a cross-cultural one and I loved it. So I want to just get you to think about some of these scriptures that talk about what is discipling really all about? I want to suggest to you what Paul said when he said to his, um, when he said, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. So when I'm walking with people and discipling people, I want them to learn about Jesus. And I'm hoping that through my life, they will see something of that. Because Jesus is always our great example. It's not primarily other people. I don't want people to look at me either. I want people through my life to see more of Jesus. So other people in your life might have been a big influence on helping you come to know Jesus. But, you know, sometimes they disappoint us. Have you ever been disappointed by a church leader or someone you really trusted? It can really be very unsettling. It can be very disappointing. That's why I want to say we need to keep pointing people to Jesus. Our life needs to point people to Jesus. I don't want people to look at me and think I am the one who has all the answers. Jesus is the one who has, has the answers. Another verse that I found very practical, whatever Paul said to Timothy, who was his disciple, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Now, that's a very practical way of saying Discipleship is just walking alongside people, just like Jesus did with his disciples, so that they can see, hear, and learn from us as we do life together. Now, when I first started discipling people, I was very much thinking about what do I share with them today? Are they learning their memory verses? Are they, you know, but 
the longer I've gone on in discipling people, I've realized that it's walking alongside them that really is so powerful. Yes, I still want them to be studying the word, meditating on the word, but they need to see in me how that works out in life. So this verse in Philippians 4.9 is an important one for every one of you. You might think, oh, I can't disciple people. You can. Every Christian, and especially you people who are studying to be leaders, can disciple people. And can I say, I believe you must disciple people. You need to set an example. No matter how busy you are, you must disciple people to show people that that is what being a follower of Jesus is about. Another verse, Peter, when uh, Paul was talking to Timothy, his disciple, he said, be strong and all the things you've heard from me say in the presence of other people, entrust to people, uh, reliable people who will be able to teach others also. So, and join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ. Whoa, why did he add that? Because following Jesus will involve tough times. It will involve a level of suffering. So you need to be a living example to others of what Jesus is, following Jesus is about. But look for faithful people to disciple. Be thoughtful and careful. Look for those and pray about it a lot who you should disciple. And I can say, as every part of ministry involves, it can involve hardship and suffering. Uh, there are times where you really, it's costly to disciple people. I used to have to travel uh, to places to disciple people in Indonesia. I would travel for three hours on a motorbike to very isolated areas to disciple and encourage believers who were in a difficult situation. And uh, my back today still suffers from riding on those motorbikes. I've had a, a CT scan on it in the last couple of weeks because it's causing me a lot of difficulty. It has for decades because of the difficulties of riding hundreds of kilometers on really bad roads in Indonesia 30, 40 years ago. Now, that's a simple area of suffering. There are other areas that might be yours, particularly in working in resistant areas. So here, here's just a few ideas uh, that I want to share with you, perceptions of what that's like to be an authentic follower of Jesus. Oops, it went. My, I just want to say these, I think, are the characteristics that you should think about in your life. I'm not going to go through them now because we're, going to run out of time but i want you to reflect on them. but firstly you cannot take or disciple someone further than you are in your walk with jesus you can't so you need a deep do you know the word resilient that means a faith that's tough and strong and copes when things are not going well you need a strong faith in jesus I mentioned these, this verse here in 2 Corinthians 4 in 1, 8 and 9. Quite interesting. I'll just give you a brief idea of it. I want you to reflect on it. Paul's talking to this new church, and he said, I want you to know about what we endured in Asia. We suffered greatly there, and we even despaired of life itself. We thought that a sentence of death was on us. He was going through a tough time. But he said God allowed that to happen basically so that we would trust him more and show his power at work in a difficult situation. Can I just encourage you? You will be tested and tried. And you, God wants you to have a strong conviction about his sovereignty. Nothing is outside of the hand of God. That doesn't mean God causes things, no, but he can work even when things are really going bad. We're in COVID. 
I believe in God's sovereignty in the midst of COVID. I believe we can trust that he will work for good in what seems like an incredibly bad situation. And it is bad, but God can still be trusted to walk with us. So he wants us to have a consistent life. By that, I mean it's the same on the inside and the outside. What do I mean by that? How you live at home privately when no one is seeing you, you need to be the same in public. People, you need to be a person who it doesn't matter where people see you, you are the same. Patience and perseverance with disciples. Have you ever been frustrated with someone you've been trying to help? I guess you have. But maybe people have been frustrated trying to help you when you're growing as a Christian. Oh, think about that. And so God is calling us to be patient with young Christians, with people who are growing slowly in their faith. I want to share a story with you about one of our missionaries who worked in Algeria for many, many years. Now, you probably know where Algeria is, North Africa. Strong Islamic presence there. Very few Christians. And 30, 40 years ago, there were hardly any. And I remember this man used to come to our leaders conference and people would talk about people coming to faith and exciting stories. I could see him sitting there kind of with his head down because there was so little happening where he was. But he discipled a person, one person he helped come to know to faith. And that man is named Ali Ahab. And Ali Ahab now is one of the major people who has influenced Algerians and many others in, in, in North Africa for faith. He is the public face of CCTV, which goes into North Africa. He preaches and he shares the word of God and tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of North Africans know Ali Ahab. He's not allowed back into Algeria. Now the Algerian authorities don't want him back there because he's so significant for the kingdom of God. But without Jerry Brittenden, this man who discipled him, we would not have an Ali Ahab. You need to be patient and persevere, as he did for many years in discipling. We don't know what God might do through your faithful disciples. You need to rely on the Holy Spirit's power and authority in ministry. I want to tell you another story. We had a, 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 one of our missionaries who had a real burden to go to East Timor, which was Portuguese Timor back in the 60s. And he'd been trying to get there for a long, long time. He spoke Portuguese. He wasn't Portuguese, but he'd learned the language. And eventually he got there. But sadly, he was only allowed there for two weeks and the government kicked him out because they knew he was a follower of Jesus. Two weeks in the country, that's all. He'd been praying for it for years. But while he was there, he helped some people who knew about God to really find Jesus and he started discipling them. And what did he do? He started giving cassettes in Portuguese to them about growing in Jesus. Now, in the year 2000, I went to Portugal to East Timor when it was devastated just after that, taking food packages in. And I met one of the people he discipled. A couple he discipled ended up becoming the leaders of the largest church in East Timor today, thousands of people, and they still disciple all of their leaders through using cassettes, just like they were taught. Amazing. His two weeks in East Timor has led to generations of people being discipled and discipling others. Isn't that an amazing story? And so I want you to be encouraged. You don't know 
how influential your faithful discipling of other people might be. You can see these other principles here. You need to have a teachable spirit and a humble spirit. We have much to learn from others. And I look, I want to say this strongly to you. As I understand it, all of you are doing, is it a master of divinity you're doing? Is it a master of divinity you're studying in? Yeah. Okay. So you are doing serious study. Now, when you go back to your country, people will say, wow, you have been overseas and done really important study. You are people who have a lot of knowledge and understanding. Please be teachable. You still have much to learn from the people around you. Your knowledge can be a special thing, but do not let it affect the way you view other people and the way you learn from others. I went to Indonesia. I'd done study. I was a pastor and I had done some other study as well. And But I, I thank God that he helped me to have a teachable spirit. So I wanted to learn from my local people. The people I was discipling helped me enormously in understanding about their life, their culture, and how they saw God, which was different in some ways from the way I understood the way we would live our lives as followers of Jesus. And that helped my ministry to become much more effective. So what I'm saying to you through this is you need to have a humble spirit and you teach others not just to make them a disciple, so, but give them the gifts and the capacity to disciple others. It's costly. It takes lots of time, but it's worth it. Absolutely worth it. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about group or individual discipling. I have done both, and they both are useful. But if any of you end up going into a really resistant culture, you often have to start with individuals because you don't have the group. And that's fine. I've done individual discipling, but I, I like collective discipling. What that, that's what that I mean by a group. Whenever possible, I think group discipling is better because what I have found is that when I work with a very small group in discipling, I do not have to be the teacher. I can just keep asking questions for to learn what they are learning together. So we'll share a passage perhaps and say, now what do you understand this is saying? Someone will say something, that's an excellent insight. Does someone else have something? So that I am not the key person. They can begin to learn how to teach and encourage one another. I believe group discipling is an excellent way if it's possible. Also, when you do, when you do your group discipling, uh, you, you, can, you can help the group, you can develop leaders that way. One-on-one uh, -on -one discipling is more personalized. In other words, the benefit of it is you can focus on the particular situation each person is in. But I prefer, if possible, to disciple a group of people. Can I share another reason why I've become more aware of this? In Indonesia, which is a collective society, I worked amongst a group there, what there was a great tendency, particularly because I was a foreigner, if I was having a close connection with someone, someone they say, oh, he is his favourite. We are not. We are not spending so much time. He likes them better than us. Well, that's a problem. But if you have a group of people, that saying doesn't happen so much. And it can also prevent the person you're discipling from feeling I'm really more special than anybody else in this early stage of becoming a follower of Jesus. 
So that's something for you to think about as you disciple people. So my experience in discipling, very briefly before we uh, have a short break, your life is the most important thing in discipling. Not having lots of resources. Yeah, resources are helpful. Some people think, oh, I don't know what to share. Share your life. Share with people how you follow Jesus. That is the most important thing. Can I share with you now that I had many of the people I was discipling were evangelists or uh, people who were beginning to grow in Jesus. And what I learned after leaving Indonesia is that what they saw in my family life, they often stayed overnight in our house. These were the things that helped them to see Jesus more than all of the things that I said. I had one person say 20 years after I left, it was the way we saw you in your family, the way you lived at home, that really impressed us about what being a follower of Jesus was really all about. So let people see you, walk alongside them. I meet regularly with them. I ask lots of questions. I don't say a lot. I say less now when I'm discipling people than I used to 20, 30 years ago. I want to hear from other people. Yes, I have some things to say, but I want to know how they are doing. People learn best by self-discovery. I'll explain that. If many people have heard me preach, you know, but when people discover a truth for themselves, it's much more real than anything they hear from me. Have you, you know that in your life. When you've been maybe walking with Jesus and you've come a, a revelation of some truth, it's incredibly special to you. Now, you might have heard that truth 10 times in a sermon, but it has not quite touched you. So what I want to do in discipling is help people discover truth about God for themselves that will enable them to walk along and be confident to share their life with other people. Okay? Your disciples can be more fruitful than you. Pray for this. You, one of your challenges is that you will be regarded very highly uh, by people because you are well educated and you you have a place of distinction in their culture now because of what you're studying but you need to trust that god will make the people you are walking with they might be simple village people they might be people who are not well educated uh, from a, a, a normal education standard but they can be powerful for jesus I've discipled some people who did not have a great education, but they were wonderful disciples and very fruitful for the kingdom. That is what we need to be trusting God for. So I want you just, oh, this, this group interaction thing is probably not so helpful. Why don't you just think of a time, just pause now, before we have a break. Think of lasting fruit that has come out of good discipling, either in your own experience or maybe you saw someone who's been discipled. Think about that. And what do you perceive as the biggest challenges to be overcome, to be a good disciple in your context? What are the things that for you would make it challenging and ask god to give you grace whether you feel you're a good disciple or not god's last word jesus last words were that we should all be making disciples this is not a gifting thing 
This is the calling of being an authentic follower of Jesus. So I want you just to take a couple of minutes now before we have our 10 minute break to think about discipling. What has been your experience? What have you seen that has been positive? And what do you sense God has for you as you move forward? What can you be putting in place now? Some keys that might help you in the future to be a better disciple for Jesus. Think about that for a couple of minutes and then Jeff will give us a break. My prayer for you all is that wherever you are, whatever your responsibilities are, you will give serious thought to be helping somebody else grow in Jesus at a personal level. I speak at, I've spoken at many conferences. That's one of the things that I've been doing for the last, I don't know how many years, but I want always to be walking alongside people. I'm still doing it today with new people here. And I've done it sometimes even overseas by uh, Zooming and so on. So don't let responsibilities from being a disciple of people. Please, please, please. Have a good break. People, we... Cool. we, we we needed about three or four tries. So yeah. our, our second session is on church planting. Now, how many of you, you don't have to put your hand up, how many of you excited when you hear about church planting? Put your hand up if you are. <laughs> it's not, not bad if you are. Because you're doing MDivs, most of you are probably not thinking about church planting. Would that be right? doesn't mean you're not interested in it. it and so church planting might be something that you are not feeling you are primarily gifted at doing mm. would that be true how many people feel they have a gift of church planting in this group okay that's okay uh, look i don't think i have a particular gift of church planting but i got sent and I went willingly to a country, uh, Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim country in the world. And by God's grace, I was there at a time when there was a very special movement of the Spirit of God, so that more Muslims came to faith in Indonesia in that time than has ever happened in 1400 years. So that was a very special season. But I want you to look at this map again, this picture again that I had the other earlier. You see, when people are passionate about discipling and church planting, the church grows. So whether we feel gifted or not, we need to be committed to the idea of seeing new churches planted. We need to be committed to that. You might and I would encourage you to try and be involved in discipling or church planting at some level, even if it's not your major ministry. My gifting tends to be more in teaching, equipping, leading, facilitating, strategic planning, 
but God called me as part of that to be involved in a church plant where there were no Christians. So I'm really pleased about that, that that happened 40 years ago because I know what that feels like. That has not been my primary ministry for the last 40 years, but I remember how challenging it is to pioneer church plant. And that was really helpful when I was the international director. I can remember the dry feeling I had in my mouth when I was going out to try and meet the first person that might be a contact for the kingdom. And just trusting that God would go ahead of me because I knew that I could not plant a church. So it was helpful that I didn't feel confident because I think it made me trust God more than ever. So I want to talk to you about what I think, these are my ideas, of what the key characteristics of effective church planters are. And first and foremost, it starts with your relationship with Jesus. Love and devotion to Jesus needs to be the primary motivation of a church planter or of anybody involved in any ministry, actually. If Jesus is not centre in your life, and if your love for him is not more important than the ministry you do for him, you have a problem. And I don't say that lightly. I know many lovely people who are very gifted and very competent, have great understanding, but I think their love and devotion of Jesus needs to be improved because it's so easy to get involved in ministry and subtly our ministry can become more important than just knowing and loving Jesus himself. Reliance on the Holy Spirit. Well, because as I told you, I don't think I've got great gifts in church planting or evangelism. I desperately needed God to help me. And by God's grace, he did. But I want to tell you a couple of stories about this. Uh, I want to tell you a story that comes out of Africa. We've got a few people here in Africa. They would know where Equatorial Guinea is. And back in the 1930s, WEC, our mission, wanted to see the work of God go on in all parts of Africa, and particularly in West Africa. And we tried for ages to try and get people, get a visa. The Portuguese were the colonial power there, and they did not want Protestants in that country at all. So nobody could get a visa. And our team in the UK were, had been praying for years about Equatorial Guinea and couldn't get a visa. And the leader of WEC at that time was a man called Norman Grubb, who's written a lot of books. And he said to the people, but he said to a lady who wanted to go, we can't get a visa. Why don't you just go without a visa? Okay, there's an idea. This is a faith thing. It came out of prayer. We've been praying for a long time. So she got on a boat. In those days, it took several weeks to get there from the UK. And she got on a boat without a visa. So the problem, what was likely to happen was, where is your visa? You don't have one. You go straight home. How embarrassing would that be? How would you like to be in that situation? Well, God was within this plan. The Holy Spirit was there. So on the boat, she met Portuguese people. And they happened to be government officials. And she had a really good relationship with them. They liked her. And as soon as she got to Equatorial Guinea, they took her to the governor and said, oh, look, we met this lady on the boat. She's a lovely lady. And within a few minutes, she had a visa. More than that, she was the first Protestant missionary allowed into Portuguese, Equatorial Guinea. Into Portuguese Guinea, sorry. Uh, the Equatorial Guinea is another story. I'd love to tell you another time. Into a Portuguese Guinea. And so she was able to begin ministry there. And out of that, 
we have an amazing ministry of grace in that country. We've been able to see many, many churches planted and uh, unreached people groups reached. Why? Because a lady, after much prayer with our team, went with trusting, doing a crazy thing, faith risks, is my point further down, faith risk, possible embarrassment, but believing God was opening a door. And there are times in church planning where we need incredible faith and we need to do something that seems incredibly impossible. God does impossible things. God opens impossible doors. I think of one of our teams. I'll mention the, uh, well, I mentioned the country. Uh, I, I won't mention the country. Uh, it might be sensitive. Uh, but where there are no churches, and they have been, they prayed and prayed as a team to go into areas where there is absolutely no Christian witness. And they prayed and prayed and said, Lord, we're praying that you'll open doors for us. And they believe that uh, praying for people might be, and seeing the Holy Spirit do something special in their lives uh, could be a way of opening doors in this incredibly dark Buddhist context. And so they went, a team of 15 went, young people, some of them were teenage children as well, and they spoke the local dialect as well, and they prayed for people. They, they looked for someone who was sick, and they saw someone and said, look, do you mind if we pray for you? And they said, oh, okay. And they prayed for that person, and then they said, oh, my uncle over there, he's very sick. And so they went and prayed for him, and God miraculously healed that man, miraculously healed him. And then all of a sudden, people got very excited, and they ended up being right outside the, 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 the Buddhist monastery, which is the centerpiece of that whole town. And they prayed for people for over three hours. People were saying, pray for me, pray for me. Because God started doing amazing things. People started getting healed. And others were saying, come, you've got to pray for us. And they were able to share. They say, look, we, we don't have the power to do this. It's Jesus that's doing it. And so it was the beginning of an opening to see the gospel break in. Now, I'm not saying, oh, that's what you need to do. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that. God, as they prayed and waited on him, crying out to reach these people that were unreachable, he opened a door for them. God has incredibly interesting ways of opening doors for people. Just like I said about the man who went to Portuguese, uh, to, uh, which is now called East Timor, used to be called Portuguese Timor. It seems so disappointing that he only got there for two weeks. But God used that to see a church planted. And he connected those people with a church from Portugal that was able to continue that ministry that God in his grace began through him. Brothers and sisters, God wants his church to grow. Ephesians 1 tells us that God has put all things under Jesus' feet and has appointed him to be head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The church is really important to Jesus. The church on earth is the glory of God. The manifold wisdom of God, we read in Ephesians 3.10, is revealed not only on earth, but in the heavenly place, the principalities and powers, as the wisdom of God. We look at the church and think it's not so great, but it is the presence of God is in the church. That has changed the way I think about church. You, we need to see churches planted where there is no church. When their church is initially planted, amazing things can begin to grow.
Ali Ahab, I mentioned the man who, who helped that man get discipled. Today in Algeria, there is well over 100,000 believers. 150, some people say maybe 300,000 people. Uh, Berber Christians. There has been an amazing movement of the Spirit of God. And Ali Ahab has been a part of that. And one man discipled him. The church grows. And those Berbers are amazingly bold for Jesus. They share their faith. We don't know what God will do if we are willing to take faith risks, trust him, and work with others to see a new church planted. There are some principles here that I want to just share with you. One of the challenges of us as leaders is that we, we don't want to have any mistakes. Do you think, I like to have things done well, okay? I like the things, and, and I've learned quite a bit of things over the years, but I've learned that I need to encourage and release other people who are in my church planning team to do well, and they will make mistakes. How do you cope with mistakes? That's a really important question I'm asking you. You see, we need to be able to cope with failure, with mistakes. If our identity is secure in God, we can take faith risks, we can cope with people making mistakes. But if our identity is tied up with how people see us or our position and ministry role, we will not be able to take the faith risks that are needed to open doors in new places. So I want you to think about this, uh, these points later, right now, but we do need to persevere. Church planting is one of the most challenging ministries uh, in the world. The devil does not want churches planted. He does not want groups of believers to be glorifying Jesus. He will do anything to stop that. We will suffer when we're involved in church planting at some level or other. I think of one of my dear brothers who is now in glory, he was working in Vietnam and the, the, the Viet, Viet Cong put a, 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 a limpet mine on the side of his house and blew that up when he was asleep and the roof fell in and he lost his eardrum, but he also was burned all over his body and his daughter was terribly burned on her feet, but they survived. He had to go home in a cast from right up to his neck, right down to his feet. Huge years of recovery. But God has planted churches in Vietnam. And as, as Jeff could tell you at another time, we have thousands of believers there and the church is growing stronger now than it has for, for decades. We don't know the impact we can have for the kingdom of God uh, on planet Earth. We just need to be faithful to the calling of God upon us. Um, I, I'm waxing, uh, I'm, I'm carrying on about this. I've got some other things I want to share with you, but the, your character and your commitment is crucial. Not only in church planning, but any ministry God gives you, but particularly in church planning because it's always tough. There will always be setbacks. While we were in Indonesia, we were involved. I became the leader of the team. We started developing new ministries. God was blessing. Kind of had a mini revival there while I was involved in a ministry. And we were planning. We, we believed God opened a door for us to start going to the Muslim strongholds of Sumatra. And right at that time, I went on an exploration trip with others to see. We, we knew God was calling us to this. And I came home to find my son seriously ill, uh, sick, couldn't walk, couldn't do whatever. Uh, we ended up getting him home a few days just in time, had leukemia. He was four years of age. Uh, that was the end of my ministry there. I took three years 
to process that with God. God, what are you doing? But God raised up other people to do that. It took a few years. The vision that God had given me, I said, Lord, I'm sure you're in this. I was the leading of the team. But Lord, I kept praying into it. But the team didn't send anyone to Sumatra for some years. And then I got called back to minister at their conference seven years later. And unbeknownst to me, on the agenda for the conference was ministry to Sumatra. They committed a team to there, and we've had people there ever since. That was in 1991. So that's 30 years ago. So, brothers and sisters, I share that with you. Pain, difficulty, absolutely. Uh, in my own journey is that when tough times come, God gives us grace to hold tightly to him. But we need to know him well. You need to know him well. Keep growing in Jesus. At the end of his life, when he was 60 years of age, Paul said, oh, I want to know him better. I want to know Jesus better. My goodness, I hope that is your desire today to know Jesus better because then he will be able to use you to do the challenging things that need to happen in this life. God calls people who have a deep, strong faith to do amazing, profound things for his kingdom. And you've got to learn through the tough times. Keep hanging on during the tough times. Look, I've got a lot of things to talk about church planning, and, uh, but I think you can read most of those but I'll just give you some ideas. Church planning is not a ministry of an individual. It has to be a team. Form, and so preparing and forming your team is critical. Uh, too many people in the past have said, I want to be a church planner, but I, I find it too difficult working with other people, so I'll just go and do it myself. I'm sorry. We need to be a team. We all, God, God is a unity. The Godhead is three working together. The church needs to be people working together. He's called us into community. And then phase two, you need to learn language and the host language and understand the culture. Brothers and sisters, short-term teams, uh, look, there's a place for them, but I'm sorry, I'm not really committed to them because we cannot really engage with the unreached peoples of our world or with any people, unless we truly understand them. I'm sure there have been times in your life where you've been with people of another culture and you felt they don't understand me and they're not really interested in understanding me. It's not a great feeling, is it? Well, if we are going to be emissaries of Jesus, we need to be able to speak the language of people and understand how they do things. I had a very steep learning curve when I went to Java in Indonesia. The Javanese are very different from funny Aussies, I tell you. And the way I used to do things in Australia was okay there, but it was not okay in Java. And so I had to learn to work very differently so that God's grace could reach out to Javanese people. So we need to learn language well. And you know, if you're going to plant a church, the gospel needs to be shared widely. Every chance we get, it's got to be done appropriately. You don't just go up and say, have you heard about Jesus? Blah, 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 blah. You can't do that. But we need to be open for the spirit to use us to, uh, to share the good, good news of Jesus. And when you start discipling people, you do it with the goal of seeing a church planted and so on. You can see all those points there. It's really important if you are a foreigner involved in church planting that you put in place, point phase six, local leaders very quickly. As a foreigner, you will never be regarded as an authentic insider. You need to have local people. They won't know as much as you. You might have more experience. That's where you need to trust the Holy Spirit to disciple them well, 
equip them well, walk alongside them. Don't, don't be too, allow for risks. They'll make mistakes, encourage them, build them up, help them to be empowered to do the job well. It's not easy. It's frustrating. You people tend to make mistakes. And the devil is so intent on preventing the church being planted that he will work hard. Folks, you need to be serious prayers. So some ref personal reflections on, on church planting. God is the key person in church planting. We are his servants. You cannot plant a church and neither can I. I that's why I'm a little nervous about church planters. It gives the idea that we plant the church. God plants the church. We work with him. We are laborers with Jesus in seeing churches planted. So any fruitfulness that comes from the ministry we might be involved in, we need to constantly realize it comes from him. Be sensitive to what God do whatever good doors God is opening. Sometimes it's a crisis in, in a situation. Uh, I've studied sociology and psychology and all those kind of things as well. So I've become aware that we, we, it's, there are a lot of things, like COVID is a wonderful opportunity for the gospel. It can be. People are very concerned. Their lives have changed. Whatever culture, whatever religion they're into, we have an opportunity to engage with people and to talk with them, and God can open doors. We don't have to open them. I believe God will do that if we put ourselves in a place where we respect people, we listen to people, we engage with people, we are compassionate, and we have the good news of Jesus to share. God will open doors. God goes ahead of us. I mean, I, I fish sometimes down the beach. This, this is here in Australia reaching Australians who are not from another country is very difficult. They're ter terribly resistant. One of the most resistant people groups I've met, I'd rather be in Indonesia than here to try to share the gospel. Even though Muslims might be very, very strong, you can have, at least engage with them about things of God. But anyway, God gave me this opportunity to share with someone I ended up, I won't go to the story, he had cancer, I prayed with him. He shared this story with other people. He came come to Jesus within six weeks. It's just an astounding story. Uh, we'd talked for months before that, built a relationship. It was a God opportunity, and it was just one of those steps in a whole process. He's dying of cancer now, but he loves Jesus, uh, and he's, he, I know he's securing God. What a wonderful gift. Fishing on a beach, you know, God opened a door. You know, you don't have to be preaching. You don't have to be in a spiritual context for things to happen. I was in hospital with a serious, serious uh, issues for a couple of, uh, two years ago. And God gave me amazing opportunities, amazing opportunities to share about Jesus with people and to see people's lives being changed just in that context it was a context where people are much more spiritually open because they're going through real challenges and i had a quintuple bypass which is serious serious business so i was on a, a level playing field with people and i was able to share with them i'm encouraging you don't look for some normal opportunity god can do amazing things wherever you are Look for what I call people of peace. These are people who have the capacity to influence a lot of other people. I, I, I wish I was more aware of that when I was younger. I look for people of peace now. People who I know God can use to influence many, many others. So these, these are great principles for you to think about. Be open, always be open for the unexpected. You know, when that incredible tsunami happened in Indonesia and uh, right across the world, but mainly in Indonesia, off Aceh, uh, in 2004, uh, that was a terrible catastrophe. 
but it also opened a, a door for people to Christians to get into Archie in a way that they've never been before. And the followers of Jesus, little groups of believers came out of even a tragedy like that. So I think in this world we're in now, wherever your situation is with COVID, this is the worst situ pandemic that's ever hit uh, uh, the world in a, a hundred years. Be open for the unexpected, for God to be able to use you to see his kingdom grow. Consistent prayer is of absolute, absolute, absolute importance. I could tell you so many stories about how people have prayed. I think of one of our guys, uh, oh, how long have we got? Not long. Uh, let me just say, prayer is absolutely critical. And whether you're involved in church planning or not, you need to be praying because God said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility to be praying every day for the kingdom of God to grow around the world, particularly in the tough places. It's, it's so important that you, in your leadership role, encourage people to be praying for the unreached areas of the world. That's the least you can do. Have information, make it available to them. There's lots of other things. Faith and perseverance, I've talked about. It will be costly. It's always costly. Team ministry, you've got to be focused. Uh, oh, there's so much. But there, what I've got also then, I've put it in your notes. There are, I, I want, I, there's 10 elements out of the church planning movement that are very helpful to think about and I want you to look at it. Church planning movements, if you do not know about it, was a, a, a movement by which churches rapidly multiplied. I've given some details about that for the additional stuff that you'll get with your notes and you can get that book called Church Planning Movements if you want to. Uh, I, I'm not going to go into that. You can look at that yourself. I want to go to the next bit. Uh, about some things that I think are really important uh, for uh, what will I do now? Well, I just I, I'll, I'll let you read that. I'm so, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. I want you to have questions to ask. I want you to be able to ask. For... Sorry, my. Uh... I've got my phone going, sorry. Uh, I, I've run out of time. Um, prayer. Look, can I just say faith and perseverance and prayer. This, in all my years of ministry, if there's one thing I would do differently, I would pray more. I've always been a prayer, all right? Prayer has always been important to me. I've realized the importance of it. Praise God from when I was first uh, starting to disciple people. So it's not that I haven't prayed, but if I did anything more, I would pray more and do ministry less. I look back at the times when I was first involved in ministry and I would just, and, and I, was, I was a pastor of a church of 500 before I was, when I was in my early 20s. Um, for a period of time and it was just an, an, an incredible job and I didn't know what to do and I would spend two or three hours just saying Lord you've got to leave me today you've got to help me to know what to do uh, and God opened doors for me and I, I mean it's interesting for 40 years later I, I've, 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 I've been in a life group with a lady who was in that church and she said you know I was just about to give up on God and, and you, I was only there for a period of time they wanted me to stay on longer but I wanted to go to mission field and she said that your ministry was life-changing for me she ended up becoming a missionary herself all I'm saying is look I was not the greatest obviously the young inexperienced pastor I've done a few done some pastoral work I've been involved in pastoring other churches but this is a big church and so prayer was the key for that and I realized that and in the ministry uh, as a leader of WEC, 
prayer is critical. You're doing postgraduate studies. Folks, that's helpful. But prayer is critical. Prayer is absolutely critical for you. And if I can give one thing for you to do, be a people of prayer. Let the Spirit of God speak to you. That's the only way you're going to hear the things that God is wanting to do. Your studies are good, but your relationship with God, building that, holding that steady, even when you've got many responsibilities, is critical. And God will build his church as we, as his faithful servants, do what he asks us to do. I've got these just reflection questions. Um, What, no, we won't break into groups for it. What priority do you feel prayer has in your local church community? What are one or two things you might be able to do so that prayer has a more important role in your own life and your own community? I'd like you to take two or three minutes to think about that, and then we'll have time for questions, Jeff. Okay? <laughs>